Thank you so, so much. Oh, was great. Sorry. Thank you. Hello. Hey, thank you for being here. I'm so uh, glad to have the opportunity to be back. Uh, thank you, Professor Ross. Uh, thank you to all of you. I know most of you are students who are uh, here. Uh, how many of you are not students and are here? Okay, it gives me an idea kind of who's in the room. So I think it's safe to say that the majority of people here are. My mother actually graduated from uh, UC Berkeley many years ago. Yeah, isn't that interesting? <coughs> uh, this is so long ago that a woman would even say this. I was going to go to law school, but I married a lawyer instead. Can you imagine a woman talking like that today? But that's what they said then. Um, now, the mindset of the 21st century is different than the mindset of the 20th, just as the mindset of the 20th was different than the 19th. The 20th century mindset, of course, gave birth to scientific revolution, uh, industrialization. There were certainly many benefits and many advances in society that came from this. However, we also recognize uh, its inadequacies. We recognize the imbalances within human consciousness that came about because of it. All of this was a product of Newtonian physics, the idea that the world is one big machine. Very mechanistic, the idea that basically if you have a problem with anything in the world, all you have to do is tweak the machine. And this led us by definition to be very focused on things on the outside. Now, some of you might have studied the Transcendentalists and Whitman and Emerson and all those kind of people who were a part of a movement, not only here but in Britain as well, of people trying to warn the Western civilization that this was a, a problem in the making because there were aspects of our internal musculature that would wither away. Now, when I was your age, we used to have art posters on the walls in our dorms. I don't know if you have anything like that now. But I had these huge uh, art posters of these very tall angels. And they were painted by a Scot uh, named Edward Burden Jones. Now, I didn't even know anything about him, didn't really care. But what I was fascinated by were these huge angel paintings. Several years later, I was walking down Fifth Avenue in New York City and I passed the Metropolitan Museum. And I'm sure many of you have been there. And they have these huge flags outside. And those flags are uh, illustrations of what's happening in the main exhibits. And lo and behold, on these huge flags outside the Metropolitan Museum, I saw my angels, the angels that had been on my art posters when I was in college. And there was an entire exhibit of them and Burne Jones's work. So I go in and I'm all excited. And I got one of those little machines where you put on earphones and you're, you're listening to a voice explaining to you about the exhibit. Meanwhile, by that point in my life, I was already uh, actually writing at that point my third book, I think. And it was called Healing the Soul of America. And I was studying American history and American culture and politics and so forth. So I had been reading a lot about the Transcendentalists and about everything that I was just talking to you about about this effort that was being made to resist the assault of industrialization, to resist the assault of mechanization, to, res to resist what was ultimately, as they predicted, a kind of dehumanizing aspect of perspective that that era brought. And lo and behold, I heard that Edward Burne Jones was part of that movement. And in relation to those angels, he had said, Every time they build a machine, I will paint an angel. In other words, every time he saw some aspect of this over-mesmerization, uh, over of this overt focus on the things outside us at the expense of things inside us, he would remind us with his art of what was going on inside. Now, that was the 20th century, of course. He, with the, the industrialization, of course, began at the, in the late uh, 1800s, but it certainly came to dominate the 20th century. All of that is to point out that you are not that. Your focus, temperamentally, as a generation anyway, as those who are at the beginning of the 21st century, is not on symptoms alone. 
there's more likely to be more questioning about cause because there's more of an integrative, holistic, whole person perspective. A British physicist named James Jean said, it turns out the world is not one big machine, it's one big thought. So I talk to you as someone who realizes that you are living in the 21st century, and when I hear a lot of complaints and frustrations and anxieties of people in, who are Gen Z or any 21st century people, actually, if you're a 21st century person, by definition, what I hear as I listen to it is that you do not understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I hear is that you don't see why you should live your lives at the effect of bad ideas left over from the 20th century, particularly bad economic ideas left over from the 20th century, and I agree with you. In every generation, and certainly in every millennium, we look at what came before, and we ask ourselves, what works for me? And what works for me, I'm going to carry forward. I'm going to pass that on to my own kids. But whether it's with a, a parental system or whether it's with a generation, you recognize what doesn't work for you, and you decide to cut the cord right now. And that is what I believe we need to do in the United States of America. We have had a very dysfunctional, even to the point of malfunctional chapter of American history. It has been going on for about 50 years. It has led to a period of decline that is at this point critically dangerous. It has led, among other things, to the destruction of America's middle class. It has resulted in a $50 trillion transfer of wealth from the bottom 90% to the top 1%. It is why we do not have Medicare for all or universal health care like they do in every other advanced democracy. It is why you in your generation are preyed upon with college loans that did not even exist before the 1970s. When I was your age, there were tuition-free college situations at University of Texas, University of California. I'm sure you realize that about University of California. I'm sure you realize that it was Ronald Reagan when he was governor of California that came in and said, well, we're gonna get rid of that. I'm sure you realize that that's what, the Co what made the Koch brothers notice him and say, oh, he could be our guy, and then do what they could to lift him to the presidency. I'm sure you realize they had that situation in Florida and elsewhere. I hope you realize that this whole phenomena of the college loan is nothing other than the predatory activity of vulture capitalism, which saw your desperation to better your life, which theoretically is the whole point of living in this country, that you would have a shot at that as a profit center. Because that form, that malevolent strain of capitalism, knows that where people are most desperate for something, that's where there is probably the most money to be made. This is insane. Whether you are a nation or you are parents of one child or several, right living means you set your kids up to win. You don't, you don't cut them off at the knees. You probably realize that in other advanced democracies, they have subsidized childcare and paid family leave probably realize that we have carcinogens in our food that we do not have in other advanced democracies. You probably have read about a bottle of ketchup in the United States and how different it is than a bottle of ketchup in Canada or any other advanced democracy. You probably are very, very aware of what big ag has done to our farming sector. You're probably aware of the chemicals in our pesticides <clears throat> that we know harm a developing child's brain because of the lobbying and the undue economic influence of big chemical companies. The guns that flood our streets because of the undue economic influence of gun manufacturers. I'm sure you realize, and I'm sure you realize that this is a threat to your adult years, it is a threat to your children certainly, or certainly a risk of a serious threat. The fact that we are continuing to ramp up rather than ramp down fossil fuel extraction that no matter who is president, either Democrat or Republican in the modern era, they fall in line with big oil. I'm sure that you realize 
that most of our foreign policy misadventures, and there have been many, certainly in my lifetime and some of yours, have had more to do with short-term profits for defense contractors than it has had to do with any kind of righteous foreign policy. I'm sure you realize that. I'm sure that nothing I'm talking to you about today is anything you don't already know. But my message to you is that the era of data collection needs to be over now. We don't need to overanalyze this. It's time for the we the people to step in. Because the undue influence of corporate money, specifically insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, big chemical, big ag, big food, gun manufacturers, big oil and defense contractors, form a kind of corporate matrix of what amounts to economic tyranny in this country. They have such a grip because of their undue economic influence. They have such a grip on Washington that they have turned our government into a system of legalized bribery. Whereas Abraham Lincoln stood on the field at Gettysburg and in speaking of the men who had died for the North there, he said that they had given their last full measure of devotion, that a government of the people and by the people and for the people would not perish from the earth. It's perishing now. We are not, for all intents and purposes, functioning as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We are now functioning as a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. At this point, democracy is not our main governing principle. Short-term profit maximization for huge corporations is our new bottom line. And in policy after policy, our elected representatives do more to serve that short-term profit maximization of their donors than to serve the well-being, even the expressed will of their constituents. Now, on one hand, this is not the first time our democracy has been similarly assaulted by systemic injustices. Let's not, however, be the first generation of Americans to not push back. In 1776, 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, very brave people, because if the British had won the war, they all would have been hanged as traitors against the King of England. With their signing of that document, they posited into the founding document of a nation in a way that had never been done ever before and which literally changed the world. The very idea that everyone should have a shot, that everyone was created equal, that all of us were given by a creator the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The governments were instituted to secure those rights, not thwart those rights, to secure those rights. And if government was not doing its job, according to the Declaration, it was the right of the people to alter it or to abolish it. But out of those 56 men, 41 of them were slave owners. That perfectly embodies the American story. The truth is, we are both and. We have always been both and. We are on one hand and have been in every generation since the beginning, filled with people who really get what a phenomenal opportunity it is and a phenomenal responsibility to protect and to expand the ideal of genuine freedom and liberty for any human being, no matter who they are, to spread their wings and live the life of their choosing. But we have also been, from the very beginning, even to now, filled with forces who, for their own ideological and or financial purposes, had no intention of seeing that ideal made manifest. What's happening now is no different. We are not some generation dealing with challenges that have never been dealt with before. But if you look at the arc of American history, we have a lot to actually be very impressed by. Because our ancestors responded to slavery with abolition. Our ancestors responded to the systematic oppression and institutionalized oppression of women with the women's suffrage movement. Our ancestors responded to the Gilded Age and its financial inequities 
with the establishment of organized labor, and our ancestors responded to the institutionalized oppression of black people and segregation in the American South with the civil rights movement. What's happening now says only one thing. It's our turn now. Today, it's not a specific institution. It is an economic paradigm which places the short-term profits of this matrix of corporate entities before your safety, your health, and your well-being. Let us not be the first generation to wimp out on doing what it takes to push back at such systemic injustices. As far as I'm concerned, nothing's going on now except that it's our turn. And those systems of injustice now hold one political party solidly in its grip, and that systematic injustice with the other party, the party has two different, two different uh, pieces, and uh, one is firmly in the grip of the corporatist perspective, and one seems to be fighting back, except when the DNC says not to. My message to you is that the current status quo is not one which truly exalts democracy so much as it is a system in which government is enabling these corporate forces in basically robbing anyone who gets in their way of safety, health, well-being, or even democratic freedoms if they would challenge their underlying bottom line. The way I look at it, that is the new status quo. The status quo will not disrupt itself. It's time for the people to step in. That's why I'm running for President of the United States. I'm proud not to be one of them. <laughs> now they would say, oh my goodness, but she's not qualified. Because to them, qualification means qualification to perpetuate the system as it is. They think that only someone who's had a long career working within the car that drove us into this ditch should possibly be considered qualified to drive us out of the ditch. I'd like to talk to you for a minute about what the founders had to say about qualifications to be president. The founders in the Constitution say that you have to be 35 or older, check. You had to have been born here, check. And how you have to have lived here for 14 years. It's very interesting what the founders did not say. And that's in, true in a lot of cases in the Constitution, where what they didn't say is as significant as what they did say. They were trying to leave a legacy of principles, but they weren't trying to jump up out of their graves and tell every generation what to do. The principle is what was important. And a principle here is unstated, and that is the following. You don't have to be a congressman. You don't have to be a senator, you don't have to be a governor, or you don't have to be a lawyer, you don't have to be any one of the political elites in order to be president. Rather, the founders felt that every generation should decide for itself. What do you think is the skill set most necessary for a leader in order to face the challenges of our time? And I believe, I agree with Franklin Roosevelt, he said the most important job of the presidency is not administrative. He said the most important job of the presidency is moral leadership. We don't need another technocrat. We need a visionary. Now, I'm not saying I'm the greatest visionary in the United States, but I am the only one running for the Democratic nomination for president of the United States. The problem is not that we don't have enough car mechanics, political car mechanics in Washington. The problem is that we are on the wrong road. So I'd like to give to you my analysis of where we are as a country in addition to the, the political and more uh, externalized issues that we just spoke about. And I want to talk to you about where I think the United States fits into the larger evolutionary arc of the human species. Now, you're at one of the great universities of the world, and I'm sure you're studying all kinds of things. And you are studying in depth. And you are bringing to the study your deep intellectual analysis, your moral analysis, your psychological analysis, your, moral, your emotional analysis. And to me, the issue of the signing of the Declaration of Independence was not just the evolutionary step forward in a political sense that was important. To me, the signing of the Declaration of Independence was an important step morally and spiritually because it completely repudiated a system that had dominated for centuries 
by which it was assumed that only a few people were entitled. Only a few people were given, granted by God. They were called the divine right of kings. The king had power given by God. The queen had power given by God. And then they had a few rich cronies, the aristocracy. And the social agreement was that somehow they were entitled. They were entitled to the land. They were entitled to the wealth creation opportunities. Something so radical happened with that document. The very idea, obviously not embodied in the lives of everyone who signed that thing. As I said, 41 of them were slave owners. We don't look to them for the lives they lived. We look to them for the ideals that they left. And the ideal that anyone, no matter who you are, rich or poor, black, white, brown, gay, straight, non-binary, no matter what your sex, your sexuality, no matter where you came from, that you should have the opportunity to spread your wings and fly as high as you want, as long as you do not hurt anyone else. And the idea all men are created equal, and I think we're beginning to see this more and more in our perceptions of the world, does not just mean Americans either. Now, if you realize that something so big is going on here, and you realize that in the great presidents of the United States there was this recognition that something more was going on here than just transactional politics. There was an understanding of the larger meaning of all this. So here you have this, this profound variety of subjects and books and teachings. They are religious, they are spiritual, they are philosophical, they are historical, they are literary, they are cultural. They are the things you dive into in a place like this. In ways that, to be honest, as a, as a woman much older than you, I can tell you, the time will come in your life and you'll go, wow, I can't believe I had a period of life where all I had to do was think about all that stuff. And I, I, you know, I, if you're anything like I was, I certainly didn't appreciate it at the time. But the point is, that's what great universities are. The study of those things which are most meaningful and true. And then there's this thing over here, American politics. It is tawdry. It is corrupt. It is unethical. It has no honor. It's simply a big business. And our entire political system, which was designed to contain our grandeur, and it was designed to be a conduit for the will of the American people, and the more I experience, the more clear I am that Jefferson's comment that the only safe repository of power in this country is in the hands of the people, boy, do I realize not only what that means, but why it's important. I've run for president twice, and I'm telling you, the American people are not the problem. I'm not saying that we're better than other people. I don't think we're better than other people, but we're not worse than any other people. And if you give the American people an opportunity to be intelligent and to be noble and to be integritous, to be true, I see as much potential for wisdom in the American people as anyone. The problem is not the American people. The problem is a sclerotic political system that at this point sits on top of the will of the people. And in too many cases, does not even allow for the fullest expression of that impulse. And that impulse of the American people ourselves through our elective representatives saying, this is what we want, this is the direction we want to move in. That's the whole point of all this. And to me, I agree with the idea that it is the only safe repository for power in this country. Right now, because our political system is in the grip, is held hostage by a soulless form of unfettered capitalism. Right now, we are driving the planet in the opposite direction from anything that has to do with a guarantee of habitability over the next 50 to 100 years. There are so many ways in which the American people can see, oh, we're going the wrong way, and we are going the wrong way. And one major political party is zipping right towards the iceberg, and the other major political party is moving at a different angle and more slowly. One major political party represents a nosedive. The other major political party represents a managed decline. 
Now, I'm sure that there are many people in this room because unfortunately, this is something that's simply the American experience today. Most of us at this point have had the experience of knowing someone that was saying, <laughs> taking too many drugs, drinking too much, and somebody makes a phone call to somebody else and says, do you think we ought to do something? And we all know what that means. That means, should we, should we do an intervention? Has it gone too far? Did you see her drive off in the car completely drunk with the two kids in the back? Did you see him fall down the stairs, or almost fall over the balcony because he was so stoned? And that's when people who love that person intervene. Well, that's because we know that there's a certain level of abuse where if you continue to abuse your body that way, physical survival is no longer guaranteed. Well, I think we need to come out of any magical thinking we have about our democracy because the survival of our democracy is not guaranteed either. And if it is being continually abused by forces of injustice in our midst, then I don't think that we should just assume that somebody will take care of it. When I was your age, we thought that. In fact, 15 years ago, we thought that. But I think very few people are thinking it today. It's time for the people to step in. That's what the Declaration says, that it is the right of the people. And I think that the whole idea of the liberty, the freedoms that we have, let me tell you, when I'm standing up here talking to you, I am deeply aware that there are countries in this world where particularly as a woman, if I made a fraction of the comments that I am saying to you today in criticism of our government, I'm very aware of the countries in which I would be hauled off. God knows what might happen to me, even unto the very worst that could possibly happen. So this isn't just about standing up for our rights. It's also recognizing our responsibilities. Our responsibility to repudiate, it, repudiate any systems that would undermine or in any way assault this democratic ideal. And it is our responsibility to expand the franchise wherever we could. That's why we say, don't even, get, don't, don't even think about it. If you start telling gay people or transgender people, LGBTQ, whatever, if you start, even, don't even think about it. You start telling women what we can do with our bodies, don't even think about it. That's the best of the American. That's the best when we say, don't even think about it. Stop right there. Because like I said before, government of the people, by the people, and for the people is to mean all the people. And it is perishing on our watch. And we must respond. That $50 trillion transfer of wealth that has happened over the last 50 years, when in the 1970s is when I was in college. And in the 1970s, the average American couple could afford a house and could afford a car and could afford a yearly vacation and could afford one parent to stay home if they wanted to. They could afford to send their kids to college. But that's no longer true because the American middle class has completely been destroyed, that $50 trillion transfer of wealth. That's not going to change if we keep electing the people who have presided over that degradation of American society. The middle class isn't going to just miraculously reappear. The middle class was destroyed by particular policies. And we need, if we want a middle class again, if we want for you to have the economic and social opportunities that I believe every generation should inherit, we're going to have to change some things. We need an economic U-turn. We need an improved Medicare for all. We need tuition-free college and tech school. We need to completely eliminate the college loan debt using the Higher Education Act because they should never have existed. We need subsidized childcare. We need paid family leave. We need guaranteed sick pay. We need guaranteed living wage. We need guaranteed affordable housing. We need to learn to wage peace. We need a peace academy, just like we have a, a defense academy. We need armies of peace builders, just like we have armies of military personnel. We should play peace games, just like we play war games. We must learn to wage peace. We must stand for our own principles on which we purport to stand in how we spend our money and how we use our military power. And of course, that means at this time, a ceasefire now. It means that we should end America's war on drugs, which has done more to exacerbate the problem than to heal the problem. 
It feeds the prison industrial complex because almost half of our prisoners in federal prisons are nonviolent drug offenders. We've spent a trillion dollars over the last 10 years. When I was your age, there were 300,000 people in prison. Today, there are 2.3 million. And we still spend $100 billion a year on the drug war for a fraction of that. We could have a world-class network of recovery options. I wouldn't want, as president, a drug czar. I want a recovery czar. And we need a Department of Children and Youth because if we really want the country that we all would love to think is possible in 20 years, we're going to have to put a lot more attention on children, on people 10 years old and younger today. Right now, we have millions of American children who go to school in schools where they don't even have the adequate resources to teach a child to read. And if a child cannot learn to read by the age of 10, the chances of high school graduation are drastically decreased and the chances of incarceration are drastically increased. Obviously, as I said, we need to ramp down, not ramp up fossil fuel extraction. One of the first things I would do as president is cancel the Willow Project. No more talking about how I'm the climate president just because I'm doing some healthy investments in green energy, all of which are good, when at the same time as the president now is doing, I'm giving more oil drilling permits than even Trump did. And if that means declaring a climate emergency, we need to do that. We're headed towards the iceberg and we need to turn around. If I'm president, that that's what we're going to do for four years. I would not be able to get us completely around within four years, but I'm only running for one term. First of all, because I don't think a baby boomer should be president in 2028. But I think I can get us around the curve. As Eleanor Roosevelt said to Franklin, we need more than the amelioration of stress. We need fundamental economic reform is not enough for us to elect someone whose highest achieve, not whose highest achievement, whose highest goal is to help someone survive what is essentially an unjust economic system. My goal is to end the injustice of that economic system. We have 39% of Americans who now report that they regularly skip meals in order to pay their rent. We have half of American renters who cannot even afford that rent. Over half of America's bankruptcies are based on medical debt, and one in four Americans live with medical debt. Seventy percent of Americans say they live with chronic economic anxiety. We call it a mental health crisis, but the mental health crisis is itself a symptom, the cause of which, in many, many cases, is the chronic economic anxiety with which many people carry on day after day, and I have to say this, I cannot even imagine who I was in my 20s if I had been carrying tens of thousands of dollars of college loan debt, I don't think I would be standing here today. Something is wrong at the center of things. It is immoral the way we do more to serve a system of a few when it is so often at the expense of the many. The economy today works for 20% of Americans, and we should celebrate that. But that 20% is surrounded by a vast sea of economic despair. Now, I'll end with this, and then we can talk about anything you'd like to talk about. You're at Berkeley. The system wants you to succeed. The system, it is a soulless thing. It's, it's inhumane. It's not thinking about people's needs. It's only thinking about perpetuating itself. So it looks at you, and it goes, oh, they're the best and the brightest. We're going to need them. We're going to let them in, because they have to run this thing. And then the way the system will work is you will have more opportunities to make it. And then if you complain 10, 20, 30, even 40 years from now, the system will say to you, what are you complaining about? It's fine for you. Don't let them eat your soul. Join with me now, and we can change it now. And then we will know, yeah, I have a good chance of succeeding in my life, but the ultimate success is to know that I use whatever power, whatever wealth, whatever opportunity the system provides me to make sure I'm not the only one who has a chance to get in here. That is success. And when the system tries to tell you anything else, I hope that you will remember what this thing is all about.
it's not just about you making it. It's about all of us having the opportunity. And I can tell you this, no matter what success you achieve in your life, nothing will give you the ultimate satisfaction of self-respect that you'll get when you look in the mirror and know the system didn't get you. My father used to walk around the house saying, beat the system, kids, beat the system. I called my brother when I was like 50 years old. I said, you know, I think daddy meant it. And my brother said, you better believe he meant it. Beat the system, kids. Your life will be a lot better. Thank you very, very. <clears throat> Thank you.